Okay, fellow babies, we're back with Pactor Factor um, on Patreon. If you are a subscriber, go to Patreon. Uh, you, you're getting this for a measly two bucks a month, getting other sifted content if you choose to subscribe at higher levels. If you're not a subscriber, we'd appreciate if you consider it. Two bucks a month to get for early access to Pactor Factor, which is a weekly show. This is gonna cost you like 50 cents, come on. If you can't afford it, choose not to spend, it's on YouTube. All I ask in exchange is follow me on Twitter, at Michael Pactor. And anytime I say something that's particularly enlightening or infuriating, go ahead and tweet about it and uh, I'll try to respond. I do respond to probably a third of the people who comment. Uh, I respond to all the nice ones, not all the nasty ones. <laughs> Get on to our questions. Our first question, and this is alliteration, we've got Paolo Pisati from Patreon. What is going to be the hottest 2017 Christmas gadget? iPhone X, Nintendo Switch, PS4, Xbox One X, or something else? You know, by hottest, if you mean impossible to get, Nintendo Switch. If you mean best-selling iPhone 10, I said iPhone X. iPhone 10, um, there's no chance that any console outsells the iPhone 10. I mean, may, maybe the PS4 might sell, you know, six, seven, eight million. I think the iPhone 10 is good for that. Um, the Xbox One X, not a prayer um, that it sells that many. So iPhone 10 is gonna be the best selling. Hottest Switch sold out consistently throughout Christmas. Um, I kind of feel bad for kids who want a Switch because their parents and grandparents have no idea what they're getting into. And Nintendo, well, let's see, I mean, Nintendo might be cool and not advertise, because all advertising is going to do is drive up demand. If they don't have supply, that's a problem. But my bias is uh, Switch is the hottest item. You will know, just check on eBay. If it's over $301 on eBay, they're hard to get. And they're 400 bucks right now, some are 500 bucks. So, you know, even at GameStop now, you know, they're charging you like 500 bucks for a Switch bundle and they're giving you like extra Joy-Cons or some crap. I mean, they make you buy some more stuff because they know they can get you. Um, so anyway, I would wait until you can pay 300 bucks for the thing. Our next question from Sifted, from Mick Womble. We've had Mick Womble ask questions before. Do you know how many PlayStation Now customers there are? And if PlayStation views the service as a success, would it make sense for Sony to release a PlayStation 1 Mini? Oh, that's smart. Um, yeah, PlayStation Now, they have not talked about how many people have used it. Yes, they absolutely view it as a success. Um, you know, and that tells me it's in the millions, but maybe not tens of millions. So I'd say that, you know, there's between five and 10 million, but that's just a guess. They have not said. They absolutely feel it's a success. It's just an extra thing that you can enjoy with your PlayStation uh, network subscription. I think that they feel really good about it. Um, PlayStation Now gamers, they have told me, are far more likely to, to download music, download movies, do other stuff. Um, so I think that they really are just trying to get you to be a connected home customer and use PlayStation Network for everything. Your second question though is a different one. Yeah, the PlayStation 1 Mini would be super fun. And imagine, you know, I think there, there were a lot of titles back then that were Sony titles. I'm not actually sure who owns them all now. Like Crash Bandicoot, which was a Naughty Dog title, is owned by Activision. And I'm not exactly sure how that happened. Um, I don't, I, you know, somehow that was in the Sierra Games mix. Vivendi had it for a while. But how, which is Sierra Games, yeah. Right. How, they, how did they get it? I don't actually know. And same thing with Spyro the Dragon. Those were, those were Sony first party titles and somehow they're, they're owned by Activision. So I don't know the answer, but I think you would get all sorts of old retro titles that would kind of come out of the woodwork. I mean, how fun would it be to play like Army Men and Heroes of Might and Magic? I mean, those are all the fun stuff I remember on PlayStation. A PlayStation Mini, right? A Super NES Classic or an NES Classic. The, the ROM card in there, the read-only memory card in there, costs like cents, pennies, literally 15 cents. The hardware, the box itself, costs like a dollar. So if you can sell somebody you know, 30, 40 games and all that stuff for 80 bucks, 
you can pay a royalty to all the publishers. And so tell me Activision wouldn't take a dollar, you know, for Spyro and Crash Bandicoot. Of course they wouldn't. Tony Hawk won. And you, I think you could sell millions of those things. So there's probably 20, 30 bucks of profit in there for Sony to do it at 10 million. Yeah, they should do it. And, and they would make more money than making it available on PS Now because guys like me who don't even know how to hook up PS Now and don't care, I'd buy the mini just for fun. So you just would because you can. Our next question from Patreon from Adam Rasmussen or Rasmussen if you prefer. Are there any practical steps Valve or Sony can take to reverse the trend of their digital stores becoming dumping grounds for shovelware, asset flips, and mobile ports. Could content ID type algorithms be used to call the extreme offenders? Do service providers consider this before opening the floodgates or do they not care? Um, let me take it from the back. You know, I'm sure they care, but they don't care enough to spend the money to weed this stuff out because it just, you know, how many games are on Steam? I mean, thousands, tens of thousands. So, you know, I think that they care, but do they really want to pay like 10 full-time guys to play every game on the site and make sure, and then double cross-check it against every other game? That's expensive. So, you know, the point is, I think that both Valve and Sony have terms of service that say, you know, you can't rip content off or you've got to have something. It, on the consoles, it's a pretty rigorous process to get approved to put a game on the console. You don't have that in the stores, in the, in the stores that have independent games. Uh, on the one hand, you want to encourage ind indies to produce great stuff. And on the other hand, for every gem, there's going to be, you know, a hundred crap games. So, you know, I think I read that Player Unknown Battleground costs like five million bucks to make. Uh, five million. So, you know, do you want to keep those guys from putting their game on Valve because it was too inexpensive and you don't trust it? No, I mean, that's, you want to encourage guys to make really great content. Um, I guess, I guess the right question back to you is, what's the harm? So you get something you don't like, the better mechanism is you you report it to Valve. And the best mechanism is give people a money back guarantee. If you download a game and within an hour of the download you want to return it and have it removed from your computer they should give you a refund and if they did that so that would i mean the only people who would download and try a game and try to rip them off would be scumbags i mean you really want to go to all the effort of downloading something and playing it one hour so i'd say if they made every game no questions asked first hour free they would have no problem um, the airlines do that with airplane tickets. You know, you can cancel your fare within 24 hours and you get a full refund, no penalty, no fees, no nothing. That's a law. It would make good business sense for Valve or Sony to do that. You can't really do it for more than about an hour because really, come on, PC games, probably half of the games on the, on the Steam site, you could finish in a day you know, if you really wanted to. So that would rip off the publisher or the developer and would rip off Valve. But I think if you had a reasonable, you know, hey, I played it and this thing is shovelware, and if they got a dozen complaints, they just remove it from the site, that would be good. And I think that's kind of the solution. Uh, you kind of almost have to have uh, curators of the site that are users. So, you know, volunteer uh, proctors, whatever you call those guys. That, that are helping to kind of go through the content and make sure that stuff doesn't um, doesn't get on. But no, I don't expect Valve and Sony to spend the money to, as you envision. Our last question this week uh, uh, from Sifted, from A.Y. Xiao. How do you think Andrew House leaving Sony impacts the direction that Sony now takes? And how would you run Sony if you were his replacement? Why do you think he stepped down? You know, that's a good question, and I, I'm an Andy House fan, but let's be real, I'm an old guy, and Andy House has been a fixture at PlayStation since I first learned about PlayStation. I mean, I never heard of PlayStation until the PS1 came out, and Andy predated that by five years. So Andy was there from the very beginning. 
And to be honest with you, Andy rose up through the ranks from, I think, head of marketing for Sony Americas to head of Sony Europe to head of PlayStation, Sony PlayStation Europe, to head of PlayStation. And, you know, I think the guy got to the point where if anything was going wrong at PlayStation and somebody was going to be blamed, it would have been Andy. So I don't think Andy did anything wrong per se. I think more likely um, the division generates about 13 or 14 billion in revenue per year and makes very little money. I mean, they make probably a billion, but uh, they, I think they make less than 10% profit. I don't cover Sony as a stock, so I'd have to look that up, but they don't make 5 billion. And I think Sony's board of directors and shareholders wonder why. You know, this division generates a ton of revenue. Why don't they make more profit? So I think that, you know, the, it's instructive to look at who replaced him. And I don't know this guy. His name is Kodera, John Kodera, um, which his first name is like Tsuyoshi or something. He's a Japanese guy for sure. Um, but that guy ran all the network you know, PlayStation Network, PS Now, PS View, all the non-console businesses. And, you know, I don't know where the profits are in Sony, but I'm guessing they don't make much on hardware. And I'm guessing they didn't make enough on the network stuff either. And I think that it was very convenient for them to promote the network guy and now hold his feet to the fire. And he's accountable to turn a profit. So the answer is I wouldn't take the job to replace him because to be honest with you, I'm not sure that you know that you can succeed. It's a hard business to run a network business and make a profit, um, and you know nobody actually knows how much Microsoft makes at it either. It's a hard business to run a hardware business and make a profit. I mean, at 249, they're not making very much money on a PlayStation 4. Um, software business should be profitable, but they market a lot. You know, and I mean, I think it might be unrealistic for shareholders to expect that somebody is going to replace Andy and generate higher profits. Again, I, I'm, I'm kind of loyal to the guy. I've always really liked him. He's always been a gracious gentleman with me. So I was shocked and, you know, displeased when he was pushed aside. I don't think he stepped down voluntarily. I think he was pushed aside. And in fairness, I'm sure they gave him a nice severance. And he's got 27 years at a very high level at Sony. I'm sure he's got plenty of money, so don't feel sorry for Andy. And he's a super capable guy. He will find another job if he chooses to work, you know, any further in his career. But, you know, it just happens. Um, you know, the same thing happened with Peter Moore at Xbox, and look at him. You know, he moved to EA to run EA Sports, which was a step down. And then he became COO of EA, which was a step up. And now he's running the Liverpool Football Club, which is his dream job. So I once had a boss who told me, I worked for this company with about 50,000 employees and we cut our, head, our workforce to 26,000 employees. So we cut ourselves in half and he said, there's 300 million Americans who never had the privilege of working for our company, and most of them are doing just fine. So it put things in perspective. And when I left that company, uh, I had another job in between before I came to work at Wedbush, but I'm doing better now than I was doing then by a lot. And I get to work at home and not shave. So. You know, it's not really the end of the world when you lose your longtime job. Uh, Andy is a bright, capable guy. But the answer is, I think that shareholders and the board pressured Kaz Hirai to make the PlayStation business more profitable. I think that the, the reason for the dissatisfaction, again, I'm speculating, is PS1 and PS2 were immensely profitable. PS3 was not, so they replaced Ken Kutaragi with Kaz. Kaz moved up to be head of PlayStation back in 2007 or so. And Kaz turned that business from losing a ton of money to profitable. And I think the expectation was as they went from losses to profitable, they'd keep going up under Andy and Andy replaced Kaz. And my guess is it just didn't go up enough.
I think that's as simple as it gets. Um, this is business, you know, it's a profit deal. And so, again, I, I think that you'll probably see Sony do some things to generate more profit, but it primarily will probably come on the cost side, not on the revenue side. So I don't see them at all exploiting their customer. They're really a customer focused, customer friendly business. But I think you might see them, you know, cut some staff in different areas. Um, I don't know if you need a giant organization in every continent. You know, I'm not sure exactly what they've got and where, but you know, they've got a bunch of people in North America, they've got a bunch of people in Europe, they've got a bunch of people in Japan. Um, maybe they get by with fewer people, let's see. Uh, and I think Andy is a super loyal guy. I think he was loyal to all the people who have worked at PlayStation all these last 20 years or so, and they deserve it. I mean, they, they built the organization with him, but you know, you remove the guy at the top and who knows what happens. So it's like getting a new president of the United States, you know, everybody who used to work in government kind of starts getting yelled at and things get tougher and get, get, a, get change. So change can be good. We'll see. Uh, again, I'm a fan of Andy's. I will miss him. I am hopeful wherever he ends up, he reaches out because I'd like to keep in touch. That's it for this week's Pactor Factor. I appreciate you guys joining us. I'm hopeful you're, you're a uh, Patreon patron and you're supporting Shane and Sifted for two bucks a month so you can watch Pactor Factor at the low cost of less than 50 cents a week. Um, if not, if you are unable to pay as a patron or if you choose not to, you could be watching us a, a week later on YouTube, and that's fine. The only cost of admission there is I insist that you follow me on Twitter, at Michael Pactor, and anything I say that delights you or infuriates you, please comment or, or retweet. Uh, let me know. Uh, thanks again for joining us. I'll see you next week. No, what was the one with the baby's face on it? There's a big baby head, like a baby doll head. You remember that no game? Clue. God, I gotta look it up. Damn, it's a PlayStation One game. God damn, I'm the just baby head. Baby doll head. On the box art. What uh, are you googling there, Pat? Baby doll head game. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was like a big baby doll head game. This is pissing me off. What was the game like? What did you do? I can't remember. I remember I really liked it though. Baby doll head game. Oh shit. We're staying on camera while I do this. <laughs> what was the name of that stupid game? You can't remember the genre or anything? I got this. Remember, I really liked it. It was PlayStation 1. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it wasn't a baby. I just think it was a baby. It was like it's. It was like... There's a song that's named after the game. What? No, oh, there's a song, or maybe the game was named after a song. Let me just see what PlayStation 1 bestsellers. It was. Even if you could just give me the genre, that I just, I song. don't remember. I remember I liked it, and I can't remember what it was. As soon as I see the cover art, I'll know. God, I actually don't think I knew Final Fantasy was Tactics was on there. Yeah. Um, oh, shit. Driver. Remember Driver? Yeah. Shit. That went away. I liked Driver, though. Yeah. It was kind of one of the precursors to GTA. If I God, if I could just if I could just remember the damn I'm looking at these famous games. Tony Hawk. I can't remember. Fuck. Damn. I'm sorry. I can't remember. If I saw it, I would know it. Maybe it'll come to you by the end. Well, there's the Parappa, the dog. I totally see the dog one. I remember that. I remember Crash. That's a fish. It had a baby's head on it. It's a, it was like a, no, it was like a rap hip hop. It was like a hip hop a syncopation. Baby. Yeah. It, was, it had a baby's head on the box art? Yeah. What was the syncopation game? You sure you're not thinking about Nirvana? Never mind. No. It was a syncopation <laughs> game. It was a. It's like a music and rhythm game. Yeah. But what was, the, what was the name of the game? Back then, there weren't many of those. Yeah. You know, it might have been made by Harmonix. Did they have Did one? Harmonix even exist then? My, well, it was think, probably too long I don't ago. Think it did. It's probably the precursors to harmonics. I mean, Guitar Freaks, DDR. Dance I feel like Revolution. it started with a B. I don't know. You got me. I think it's because I got baby on the brain. 
<laughs> okay, I'm going to have to stop. It just pisses me off that I can't Maybe remember. It'll come oh, here. Bust a Move. Oh, Bust a Move. Yeah. Yeah, wasn't there a baby on the cover of that? Maybe. That was a puzzle game. But yeah. Now, see, this Bust a Move 2 just shows arcade. Was it Super Bust a Move? I think it was Super Bust a Move. Now, that was a game, right? Yeah. I think it had a baby. Here. There you go. Is it a baby? Come on, dude. Oh, that's PS2, though. That's a baby. Is it? Spin it around so they can see. Oh, I just turned off my screen. <laughs> God damn it. Come on. There we go. What's yeah, there the... it is. <laughs> yeah, that's a claim. That's PS2, though. But that's the game I was thinking of. It was I Super Bust the Move. Remember that game. I, I just remember I thought that was the funniest cover. <laughs> that's, but it's PS2. I was wrong. Yeah. Bust the Move. Yeah. That's hilarious. 